chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. All right. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. We started this morning in verse number 14. The Bible said, These things write I unto you, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I love that verse. I just love that verse. I never really, just never really looked at it before till this morning I preached on it. But the church is the pillar and the ground of truth and ground of the truth, excuse me. And without controversy, this is a verse we always go to in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, received up into glory. So we have the complete gospel there. Almost, yeah, well, it is a complete gospel uh, in a nutshell. And in using that verse, we can sure expound on the gospel. But nevertheless, um, we looked at the identity of the church, or the church identified. We started with Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's what the Bible says. Jesus said of himself, upon myself we're going to build the church. I'm, I will build the church, not we're. I will build the church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He didn't say, and you've heard this before, you didn't say the gates of hell would not assail against it, but will never prevail against it. And so we're not only on the defensive, in preserving and protecting, but we're on the offenses and we should be advancing. Amen. We should be advancing. All right, now we look at the significance of the church and we stop with this one. Uh, it's significant because of the price that was paid for the church. And the Bible tells us there, and the greatest verse there to look at is how he compares it with marriage. And it says, Husband, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it gave himself for it um, and so we see the significance because of the price paid all right and then secondly we look at the significance shown in the names ascribed to the church and this is where I challenge you to get your pencils out and write it down write some references down because I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly and um, just just comment on them the Bible says, uh, first of all, the church is called the house of God, right here in 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 15. The church of the living God is called the house of God, the church of the living God. We're living people. It's a living organism, a living organism, many members, one body, living people serving a living Savior. Amen. So we're talking about the church. It's not an invisible church. This is a manifestation. What you're looking at tonight around you, a manifestation of that what people would call the universal body, the universal body. This is the manifestation. This is the letters that were written by Paul. Every letter he wrote, 12, 12 letters were written either to the local church or to the pastor of that church. So it's very significant. The church, we identified the church that way. The church is a local assembly, not the building, but the living organism, the people within. All right, now, so the, the house of God, the house is a reference to the family, in uh, the family, in the, in the home. When I think of, uh, we're going to my house, we're going to my house to eat. I, I'm not thinking about a building, I'm thinking about my home, my house, my family, my kids, my wife. That's, that's what the Lord is talking about right here. So a house is uh, in reference to the family. Now, in the house, and the church should be orderly or conduct the assembly according to 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, verse number 40, let all things be done decently and in order. As we run a household and dad, uh, sh dad should be the spiritual leader, uh, mother is the heartbeat of the home, and, uh, so, and we don't fight against each other. The Lord loves us. He is the head. We're the members. We're the body. And our love and, and, and admiration and reverence are to go to Him. Amen. And everything be done decently in order. So we have that name ascribed to the church and we have that significant meaning there. And then secondly, we have the household of God ascribed to the church. And it's almost like the first one, but it, you'll find this one over in Ephesians chapter 2. You can write down the reference. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 19. The Bible says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Uh, it identified with the family there in Ephesians chapter 3. 
Now, this is a little different. The household of God, the name itself, a little different, household of God. We're talking about the house of God in 1 Timothy 3.15. In Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 19, we see the household of God. And we can use the verse in chapter 3 of Ephesians in verse 15 to get a little bit clearer picture of this, this meaning ascribed, the significance ascribed by this name. In Ephesians 3.15, the Bible says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Uh, so we're bound together. We're bound together by love, and we could read all of 1 John to prove that. We could read the Gospel of John, that we ought to love one another, a new commandment that he gives us. But uh, we're bound together, the church is, by love, by warmth, by faithfulness. The Bible said it moreover. It's required in stewards to be found faithful over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 2. So, and it's bound together by sacrifice, by protection, and... It's bound together by a degree of family resemblance. Now, I'm not going to be as bold as say you look like me. Because some of you just yell out, thank God. But we have a resemblance. The resemblance are the qualities that we should possess. Those qualities we possess. We, we, that should, we should be able to look at someone and say, well, he's part of the family. Or look at the lady. She's part of the family. How? By her actions and her speech and his actions and his speech. So we have, we should bear a family resemblance. So that we're talking about the household of God. All right, now if you'll take your Bibles and go over here to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, the Bible is called the pearl. The, the church is called the pearl. The Bible calls the church a pearl. Now, a lot of people in Matthew chapter number 13... They'll, they'll use these two verses as salvation, but they're not. If you'll notice in uh, Matthew 13, verse 45 and 46. 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Well, it can't be salvation because you don't buy salvation. Amen. You don't buy Isaiah chapter number 60, come and buy without money and without price. Drink of the water freely. Buy without money, without price. So salvation doesn't cost anything. So the pearl, now you go back to the uh, verse number 44, and that's concerning Israel. And, that, and so, so you won't be confused. You get in verse 45 and 46, that's concerning the church. The church. It's a thing of such beauty that the merchantman willingly went and did what was necessary to preach it. Now, I mean, to, to, to obtain it, to purchase it. So now, do you, have, uh, do you have an idea? Jesus did what was necessary to do what? Purchase the church. Purchase the church. So the church is called a pearl. He did what was willingly, willingly did what was necessary. All right, now in Revelation chapter number 19, verse number 7, the church is called the wife. The wife. In Revelation chapter number 19, now you write these down if you're not turning as quickly. Revelation chapter number 19, verse number 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. The wife being the church, being the church. All right, now when the Bible talks about the wife, and, all, and also in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, and verse number 2, uh, it's, it's the chaste virgin. The chaste virgin. The chaste virgin marries. We marry, uh, uh, married to Christ. We're, 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 and as it were, we're the bride of Christ, the wife of Christ, is what the Bible is telling us. Now, why does it do that? Why does it compare in Ephesians 5 a marriage to Christ? And why does it talk about the wife in Revelation chapter number 19 and the chaste virgin, virgin in 2 Corinthians chapter 11? Well, let me tell you, there's no more intimate, joyous, relationship on earth than the husband and wife relationship. Nowhere to be found. Nowhere, nowhere to be even heard of. And that, that's uh, the, the greatest, joyous, intimate relationship that a man and a woman could have. Amen. And a man and a woman could have. Amen. Uh, used to didn't emphasize that 30 years ago. But nevertheless, the, the wife, the church, is in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and the church, the wife, 
has eyes for him only. Eyes for him. We have eyes for our Savior only. Amen? So you get that. So the church is called a wife. All right, and the church is called the body. The body. You can go back to Ephesians chapter number 1, if you will. We used that this morning. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm looking at the clock going fast. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. And I know I shouldn't be governed by the clock, but um, it keeps you coming back, doesn't it? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. The Bible says this, and hath put all things under his feet. Christ has put all th uh, God's put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, so the body, of course, follows will and direction of the head, of the head. <clears throat> I'm not a doctor. I don't claim to be a doctor in anything physical. I know that I... I'm supposed to have a mind and supposed to have eyes and ears, but my brain, I'm told, controls all of these things. Controls my hand, my, my, my movements, my feet. Uh, I have to have a brain because I can't preach without doing that. You know, and so it's, it's uh, your brain controls all of that. So we, uh, the, the, it follows the direction of the head. And if you'll notice over in Romans chapter number 12, Romans, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, X, Romans. Romans chapter 12. I appreciate you that are uh, turning in Scripture, uh, but those of you that can't turn this fast, write it down. And those of you that can't turn this fast, I encourage you and would uh, exhort you into memorizing the books of the Bible. If, if you memorize the books of the Bible and you read your Bible enough, I purposefully didn't get those thumb index things. I didn't so, and I can, you can, not because I'm super sharp, but I can pretty well turn in the Bible to where the book is. And you can too. You can too. Anyone can do that. So, but memorize the books of the Bible, and I'm in Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and 5, we're talking about the, the, um, uh, uh, the ascribed name to the church being the body. And it's significant that these names, and these names are very significant to the church of what God calls them. These are Holy Spirit-inspired names that, that God puts on the church. All right, it's the body. In Romans chapter number 12, verse 4 and 5, the Bible says this, for, we, for as we have many members in one body, you'll find that in 1 Corinthians 12 as well, but the Bible says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. So we follow the direction of the head. And the head is who? Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is our head. He's our Savior. And uh, it's not the preacher that's the head. It's not the deacons at the head or anyone else. It's the, it's the Lord Jesus Christ that's the head. And we follow him and all of us. Now, as a, as a functioning part of the body, I am to support the head. As you're to support in, in every, whatever position you have in the church. And that's, we talked about spiritual gifts sometime at length back uh, a, m a couple of months ago. But everyone, everyone has a gift, and everyone needs to exalt Christ in that gift. Find out what your gift is and exalt Him. Amen? All right. And then, uh, not only that, but the Bible calls the church a golden candlestick. Do you know that? Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, the Bible calls the church a golden candlestick in verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. The Bible calls the church a golden candlestick. Now, in Revelation chapter number 2 and 3, Jesus esteemed these seven churches as the light bearers. Now, he, now there's more churches than just these seven in um, Asia Minor. But he uses these seven to portray 
the whole age, the whole church age. The whole church age. I believe that he does that. Some people disagree with that, but I believe he uses those seven churches to display the whole church age. Now, and uh, so he's the inclusive of all the churches that are magnifying him, the local assemblies that are magnifying him. The Bible says we're to be light bearers. He called us a golden candlestick. What does a candlestick do? You put a candle on it. What does a candle do? It gives out light. We're light bearers. We should be light bearers. That is, uh, what does the Bible say? We're the pillar and the ground of the truth. The church is. So that's what we ought to be. As in, and the Bible said we're golden candlesticks, light bearers. Christ through, uh, throughout the um, Scripture points out, and He does in the seven churches too now, as you read them, He points out our faults through the church age, but then He doesn't just leave us there. He tells us how to remedy the problem, amen, with His own Word. And remedy the problem, realize your problem, go to Christ, confess and forsake, and continue to be light bearers continue to be light bearers, okay? All right, now the Bible calls us uh, over in 1 Peter chapter number 5, 1 Peter chapter number 5, there is another name given to the church, 1 Peter chapter 5, and it's called the flock of God, the flock of God. In 1 Peter chapter number 5 <clears throat> and verse number 2, feed the flock of God which is among you. He's telling Peter to feed the flock of God. Peter's telling us to do the same. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. He's telling preachers, don't get in, the, don't get in ministry for, for lucre, for money's sake. Don't do it. Don't do it. Some people do. Some people do, and some people get in, their true colors come out, uh, don't get in church for money. Don't get in ministry for money. If that's, if that's your case, then stay out. Get you a job. I mean, just go, go get you a job digging ditches or building out. I mean, do something. Do something. If that's what you think, you're in it for the money. All right. And uh, so the flock of God. And the Bible says in verse 3 that we're God's heritage. The flock is God's heritage. In verse 3, neither is being lords over God's heritage. God's heritage. We are, that means it's his inheritance. We are God's inheritance. The flock of God is God's heritage. The, we, we are his inheritance, okay? All right, now, we, real quickly, um, I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. Now, we're looking at the significance of the church. The significance of the church. We looked at the church by name. And then the last thing I want to look at is the activities of the church. The activities of the church. I love the local church. Anybody that knows me knows that I love the local assembly. I'm a very strong local church preacher. I am. And uh, I think that's Bible. I don't think it. I know it is. There's a difference between thinking and knowing. I know the Bible uh, through the church does everything. Anybody else that goes outside the church and tries to do it, they're a rogue. I don't, I've had people actually come to me and try to contradict that and want to uh, say, why should I say something like that? I say it unashamedly. You go outside the church on your own. That's why some people would rather sit at home, read their Bible, and have church at home because they can't get along with anybody. Pretty much so. Pretty much true. Am I right? Pretty much true. And uh, that's forsaking the assembling of themselves one with the other as a matter of uh, some is. And the Bible says by doing that, we provoke one another unto good works. Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Last chapter of the book of Matthew, you got in the New Testament, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, the last chapter, chapter 28, verse number 18, 19, and 20. The activities and practices of the church. The Bible says in verse number 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Now, the activities of the church, the Bible makes it very clear in this passage and others in Mark <clears throat> chapter 16, verse 15, that we ought to be witnesses. We go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're witnesses by our word. Our, no one gets saved apart from the word of God. But people want to see 
a life that backs up the Word. So make sure your life matches and you be a witness. We cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. We're going to look at, be looking in the book of Acts in the next five minutes, okay? In the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 5. Acts chapter number 5, verse number 42. Acts 5 and verse 42, we're talking about a witness. We cease not to preach and to teach the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 5, 42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Daily. Daily. Not just on Sunday morning. Well, I go to Sunday morning, I do a lot. It's nowhere, I've had people, it's nowhere commanded that we ought to go to Sunday school and we ought to go to Sunday night and we ought to go to Wednesday night. Nowhere commanded. If I show up one day a week, well, if that's all you want to show up, that's all you're going to get. That's all you're going to get. That's all your Christian life, that's all your spiritual life is going to extend as well. Yeah, it, so the, you, you can, when you can come, when you can come. No one, no one in the scripture has told us when to worship, except in the book of Acts, it says on the first day of the week. On the first day of the week. But if you'll notice, on Saturday, Paul was preaching in the synagogue, the gospel of Christ. On Monday, he was doing something. On Tuesday, and then we get to Acts chapter number 5, and the people that got saved, the Bible said, daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. So we have, you know what the Faith Baptist Church has adopted to do? This is before my time. And uh, I got in on it, and I enjoy it, is that we have church every day. Every day of the week. You say, does it get tiresome? Sometimes I want to stay in the bed. Sometimes I do. And I'm like the old fellow that his wife had to remind him, but you're the preacher. No, that's not my motive. My motive is I want to be here. And, uh, but thank the Lord I have great men that'll, that'll stand in the gap and they take some days off of me on, uh, on the morning. By, on the morning, we, you call it radio broadcast. We call it Bible study uh, since we do the radio on, uh, uh, record it and send it in. But nevertheless, um, uh, we have church every day. And the Bible tells us that. It says they cease not cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. So that is one of the activities of the church. Now that's not the only activity. Look at Acts chapter number 4 and verse 31. Turn back a page. Acts 4, 31. And when they... Now remember, the church started in Acts chapter 2. Peter preached that great sermon as he, uh, as it were, used the keys of the kingdom, unlocked the gospel to the Jews, and preaching was going on concerning Christ and Him crucified and resurrected. And then we get to 31 in Acts chapter number 4, and the whole church, the, the whole Acts chapter 4, uh, verse uh, 31, we can see a lot. We can see a praying church, a spirit-filled church, a witnessing church. Verse 32, a united church. And it's just about the church. Church, church, church. The Bible says in verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the Word of God with boldness. So another activity of the church is to pray is to pray. You keep praying. Pray and pray some more. Acts chapter 12 and verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but, but, prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Praying earnestly for a particular thing or a particular person, a particular circumstances, that's what we're to do. It's called importunity. We keep, we keep pestering until we get an answer. We keep pestering. You say by pestering do we get an answer? No, but God uses that illustration of the persistent widow and the unjust judge to tell us that if, the, if this unjust judge because of importunity goes out and grants this petition, how greater, how much greater and how much more loving is your heavenly father that wants to answer it? So we keep praying about a particular subject. Keep praying. And then we... You know, it's, we're going to expect God's answer one way or the other. Yes or no? Okay? Yes or no? So, nevertheless, we keep praying. Prayer is a vital activity and practice of the church. The church, uh, the church is, uh, is God, I mean, let me say this right here. Uh, anyway, prayer. Let's pray. Let's go to the next one. All right, now, another activity of the church is to send forth missionaries. Go to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. 
And this is where, this is where I, it, in one time, just I think only one, maybe twice in my ministry, I've had, uh, it was controversial with a couple of people, but the Bible says this in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, 2, and 3. Listen carefully. The Bible says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaan, Mena, uh, Manaan, or I don't know how you pronounce it, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, when they had fasted and prayed, and it names the names up in the, the members of the, the church there at the church of Antioch, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. They sent them away. Verse 4, we can't leave verse 4 out of this. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. People want to take verse 4 and not include verse 3. So which one's right? The church sends them out or the Holy Ghost sends them forth? Both. In cooperation. In cooperation. If the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth, and the means in this age by which the Holy Ghost works and works in this age of propagating the gospel and getting it out and doing what we need to do and the activities that we're supposed to do, then it's in co-op. There's no contradiction whatsoever. God called that individual. God sends that person out. And if anyone's ever been ordained in this congregation... There's always a question at the end of the ordination service. They said, what are you going to do if we decide not to send you? And you know what they want you to say, don't you? So we say it. I'm going to go anyway. Well, and they, they smile at you. They smile at you and say, so you feel that strongly about it? Yes, we do. Yes, I do. I said, well, observing your gifts and this, that, and the other, this council is going to ordain you. I said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And uh, so it's inevitable if you've proved yourself and your gifts, it's inevitable that. But they, you know, it's just how much of a desire do you have? So God, God creates that desire. He issues that call. And in cooperation as the pillar and the ground of the truth sent them showing that God established the church and he works in this age through the church. Anybody goes out without going through a local church, I say it again without apology, they're rogue. They're rogue. God ordained this local assembly to observe gifts and to help train and teach men to go out. All right, we educate converts, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Matthew 28, verse 20. Educate converts. Again, the task is committed to the church to educate new converts. Educate the Copleys. Educate those that just got saved. But we can't stop there. Not only educate the converts, we've got to strengthen the maturing saints. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Write them down. We strengthen. We can't just park on one. You've got to go. You have to, you have to teach the maturing saints. Some people will say, well, you know all you preach on salvation down there at Faith Baptist Church. If you come to some other services, you'll find that's not true. Because you're getting some instruction tonight on the church. Amen, on how you ought to act and how you ought to operate. Amen, that's what the church ought to do. And so um, the task is committed to the church. Strengthen the maturing saints. Uh, the teachers that we have uh, should teach and to exhort and to strengthen and to help get someone from point A to point B. If we stop after salvation, if we stop preaching after salvation and don't teach anything else but salvation, what we're going to have is a bunch of babies squabbling and fussing. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 said, leaving those first principles, let us go on to maturity. Now, newborn babies in the church, they're precious. They're, they need a lot of attention though. They need a lot of attention. I watch some of you mamas give your kids a lot of attention. Mike needs a lot of attention. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you got to fix them up. You got to hold them. You got to change it. You got to do everything. You got to do everything. And, and you know, and you're looking at a church body and you're, and you're thinking if you're any kind of leadership at all, you're thinking, when's these babies going to grow up? When are these carnal? And that's what Paul called them in 1 Corinthians 3. Carnal, carnality. They've been in church, some sitting in church a long time uh, that hasn't, well, anyway. Okay, that's a, I, I told you I'd hurry. 
Maturing saints, that should be, a, that's our ministry. And it, the church does that. It's, this ministry is committed to the church. It's not committed to some... Do you think for a moment that I could go to Santa Rosa school system and say, I think that you ought to put me in as your next physics and calculus teacher. Well, how much do you know about it? Well, I, I know a little bit about it. I mean, I know what they say about it. I'm not sure if it's all true, but I know what they say about it. Well, come on in. I'm going to start you out at $125,000 a year. <laughs> and people come into church and they say, well, I want to serve the Lord. I think you ought to put me in a position. Prove yourself. How much do you know about the Bible? Well, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I feel God wants me to teach. Well, won't you stay a while till we can teach you something? Or the Spirit of God can teach you something. Amen. Stay a while. And so uh, we educate, and by the way, that ministry is given to the local church. That ministry is given to the local church. All right? And we strengthen the maturing saints. We maintain purity of the body, maintain purity of the body, and uh, we, we operate within the boundaries of the word, and that means wisely spending finances. If we spend all the money on youth, then what do we do with the building? If we spend all the money on the building fund, then what do we do with the radio? If we spend all the money on the radio, then what are we going to do with the maturing saints? If we spend all the money on that, how are we going to keep the upkeep? How are we going to buy material, Sunday school material, and educate saints and all everything that we do? So it's, a, it's not, this is not just think, I'll think I'll do this. This is by a man and a woman and, and a church body and teachers. The members is going by this book as a blueprint. Going by this precious book right here is a blueprint. And God put it all together. And he called it a church. Huh? That's right. It, it dedicated to the text. God put it all together. And you know what he calls it? He calls it the New Testament church. He calls it his wife, the body of Christ, the flock of God. And, just, and he sure loves the church. He loves his bride. And we should.